Welcome to the Tackling College Sports Podcast, the definitive resource to help you navigate your way to play college-level sports. Here are your hosts, Chris LeGates and Mark Franco, where they want you, the TCS Nation, to be your best. Welcome, TCS Nation, and thanks for tuning in to the Tackling College Sports Podcast, Session 17. I'm your host, Mark Franco, and alongside me is my co-host, don't call his kids nuggets or kiddos, Chris Legates. Today, Chris and I have the pleasure of speaking with Glenn Crooks, former head coach of women's soccer at Rutgers University. Glenn is currently an analyst for the New York City Football Club and can be heard on the Fan and the Big Ten Network. Glenn is also a host on the Sirius XM FC. Glenn is still active in coaching at the Players Development Academy in New Jersey. Without any further ado, here's Glenn. Good morning, Glenn. Welcome to the TCS podcast. Good morning, guys. It's uh, my pleasure. Hey, Glenn, uh, you know, we know that you have a lot of irons in the fire now. Can you walk us through the history of how you arrived at the position you're in today, please? Well, you said we only had 40 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to, like to uh, hope your listeners will forgive me. I am. Uh, I'm in the midst of a cold, so I'll try to keep the coffee to a minimum. No, look, I, I got. A, I went to school at the University of Georgia. I did not play soccer. Uh, to this day, the University of Georgia does not offer Division One men's soccer. They've got a women's soccer program, and that was all part of Title IX and gender equity. Where all the big football schools, SEC. Pac-10, uh, Big Ten, they all they were all pretty much forced to add women's soccer programs. And that, to be quite honest, if it wasn't for those gender equity and, and Title IX issues um, occurring, uh, you, you wouldn't see women's soccer at the level it is now because it just wouldn't have happened because the athletic directors who at that time in, in many cases were football guys, uh, still is to a certain extent, um, they weren't going to add women's soccer. So anyway, so there I was at Georgia. I played uh, for my fraternity, I played intramurals, and I actually coached those teams, um, but I really didn't know what I was doing. And I, I was there for journalism and communications. Uh, I got out. I, uh, my first job was at WMTR, WDHA in New Jersey, uh, and I worked there full-time as a sports director for eight years. But along the way, the, the, the way the coaching occurred is uh, my scholastic alma mater, Ridge High and Basking Ridge, which is the home of Tobin Heath, she's probably our most famous alum. Uh, it, it, they were starting a girls' soccer program, and I played indoors, you know, on the two days a week, and I was coaching a club team, a boys' club team, in uh, it was Somerset Hill Soccer Club. And one of the town councilmen, I was coaching his son, and he approached me and said, uh, "I want you to apply for the girls' soccer job if if you can." And I was like, "Girls' soccer? I, I honestly, I had never seen a woman play soccer." And uh, this is like 1982. And I, uh, he, he talked me into it, though. And, and, but I'm going back to my old high school where I knew the athletic director personally. I knew the principal. All my teachers were still there pretty much. So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. So I, just, I was intrigued by the fact of let's go back to, to my old school. So I started the girls' soccer program at Ridge High School. And stayed there for 10 years. But along the way, I got my licenses. I started working with the Olympic Development Program. And all the while, I was a full-time sports director at, uh, at the at MTR and DHA. And it was perfect. So I'd get up at 4 in the morning, go do my thing till about 2 or 2.30. Then I would go uh, to Basking Ridge to, to coach soccer. So I, I, was, uh, I was loving it. And along the way, I just became more attached to this coaching side as I learned more and more about the sport and how to manage things and feel more comfortable with it to the point where, where I, um, I actually started um, kind of looking into the college scene. And uh, ultimately, I took the job at St. Peter's College, which is now St. Peter's University, and, and resigned from, um, from Ridge High School and resigned from my uh, broadcast position to take this uh, job at St. Peter's. So it was St. Peter's, then LIU in Brooklyn, and then Rutgers University, and all told, it was uh, 22 years of Division One college coaching, and and then um, pretty much had enough. Uh, I mean, the experience I had was awesome. The relationships I built, the you know, the just you know, watching uh, the young women grow and 
and some of them become professional players, but a majority of them becoming professionals in other fields and and, and maintaining relationships along the way. And uh, now now they're married. Uh, the, you know, the first team I ever coached. Um, those girls are in their mid forties. They have these full families. You know, some of them now have grandchildren. So that that's where I'm at <laughs> in terms <Wow. laughs> of the. Uh, I guess you'd say longevity. And uh, so now I'm back into the broadcasting thing. I'm writing. I mean, I'm doing some things that I really never imagined I would do two years ago, but uh, I'm really happy with it. Oh, that sounds great. So you just recently mentioned uh, the college aspect of finally uh, ending at Rutgers. Are there aspects of coaching at that level that you miss at this point? I, I miss I miss training, uh, and I miss the anticipation of game day. But the games themselves, a lot of times, were torturous. Um, I love watching film and preparing. I, I think I enjoyed almost the preparation, which is the training and, and figuring out what would be best for the team leading into a particular match. Those things I miss. And then, um, you know, and the players and my staff, you know, because we it was definitely a second family because you spent so much time together on the road, uh, at home. And uh, that season is tucked into a you know a, a really tight, not really even three months. Uh, you start preseason in August, and you hope it ends in December, depending on how it goes. And Rutgers made the Final Four this year under my uh, former associate head coach Michael O'Neill. So it's uh, it was a, a brilliant year for them. And uh, yeah, but that beyond that, it's probably the only portion I miss, and that's one of the reasons um, I, I decided to retire because. I don't think, uh, you know, I, w I was lacking a little uh, of, of the motivation and the juice. You need to do the job properly. You do have to work seven days a week. You have to answer the phone when it rings. Uh, and it, it's, and when I say you have to, you can choose not to. Uh, but if you are coaching at that level, uh, which is a top 25 program, and you're competitive, you know, that's what you do. And so uh, I made the choice that was wise for me, and it was wise for the program because uh, – you know, it, it was time. Sure. So it, it's safe to say that it was more of the process. It's more of the process that you missed in the actual gameplay. Well, I'm not fond of the recruiting at our level. When I say our level, it's the highest level, Division One. Um, it's not everybody's recruiting uh, method. But my last two years, we had freshmen on, fre in high school. We had freshmen in high school, sophomores in high school, juniors in high schools, and seniors in high school. So literally recruiting four classes of high school. So you can, uh, you can just imagine the enormity of that. Yeah. Uh, every, you know, other top programs are all going through the same thing. You do have, yeah. you have children committing, you know, and you've heard, we've all heard it. You know, you have some committing even when they're freshmen. Uh, most at our level now commit when they're sophomores. Uh, there'll even be some freshmen every now and then. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's a bit crazy. And, I feel I feel a little sorry for the parents because and what happens is you play on this club team and one of your teammates early in her sophomore year commits and she's getting a scholarship. Now the other players within that team are like, "Oh my god, you know, it is time running out." And um, you know, the fact is the answer is no. But because school costs so much you know, it's unfortunate that a kid that's a really good student can't just pick their school, you know, and it just, you can't Agreed, because yeah. of finances sometimes. And, uh, but what I will say, guys, is there's a, there's a school that's affordable and has a positive soccer experience, a positive academic experience, the right geography, uh, the right climate, the right environment. There's one out there for everyone. I, you know, there are no guarantees in life, so I won't use that word, but it's out there. And that's where I think families are in control. They feel like they're out of control. Well, my daughter's got to play Division I. Right. Why? You've got to step back and say, why? There are, I could, I could list 10 Division three schools that would kick the arses of some Division I programs, are better coached, uh, will, will provide a, a, a better competitive environment than some Division I programs. So to limit yourself like that, I think is really, um, I think in some ways it's naive, but you get caught up in what everybody else is doing, you know, and that's, that's the, um, it's just like, uh, I don't know what a good example is, you know, 
yeah, but it's I, I'm I think that's unfortunate. There's a school out there for everyone, and I think people should be very careful in their choices. And I think by just sticking to Division One, you know, unless you're the elite, unless you're the elite player, and then you know you're going to Division One because there's ten schools recruiting you, you know, so you're probably you're going to find one, no question. Well said, Chris. Go ahead. No, that's a great message, Glenn. And first of all, from my standpoint, thank you so much for taking the time to be on here with us today. Uh, I followed your career for a long time. We've had an opportunity when uh, many, many years ago when you were at Brooklyn. Uh, I was at Quinnipiac, and uh, it, it's great to see. It's great to see where you are now. And, well, we got to uh, bring up some of these Connecticut names. Let's face. Are you are you ashamed to admit that you worked with Tony Horta? <laughs> <laughs> I am not. He's been my business partner for twenty plus years now. And uh, someday we're going to get him on here. He keeps giving us a hard time about not getting on here yet. All right. Well, you should put us on together and we can tell old uh, Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference stories. Or was that Northeast Conference? No, it was North, Northeast was a, Conference. Oh, yeah. North, okay. Well, I, was, I, I coached them both. I forget which is which sometimes. Well, if we, have both, if we had both of you on, I don't know if there'd be enough time. And uh, I'm not sure, especially talking over each other, because you know how the Portuguese can be sometimes when they start talking. Yeah, that's great. Well, tell Tony hi again for me. It was great seeing you guys at the Mohegan. Yeah, I absolutely will. And kind of piggybacking on what you're saying there, Glenn, uh, you've been involved in so many different levels uh, of soccer. When you look at it, can you give us a take on how you think the youth programs and the club structures are doing? Do you think we're getting it right at those levels? Well, I think it, it, you almost have to ask the question more specifically, like, in what manner for the for a high the elite level player, for the kid that just wants to go play college, or for the kid that just isn't that concerned about going to play at college, but wants that experience, you know. So I think there's, and I don't know if I have that right, but I think there's like three different ways to look at it. Sure. Um, but I, I, a club a club's responsibility, you know, some people think it's the club coach's responsibility to get kids in school. Sorry. <laughs> I don't agree with that. I think I think it's part of our responsibility to uh, provide guidance, to uh, maintain contact with coaches at the request of the team. I I can tell you what I'm doing with my current team. I coach a U17 girls team. They're called the PDA Blues. I mean, a great group. It's just a great fa- great families. It's one of the rare teams I've coached where no one has an ego that provides them with what they feel is, uh, you know, um, where it's individual ahead of team. It's, 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 it's a, just a great group. Uh, and what I'm doing with them is, you know, I've, I've met with all of them at some point along the way just to see what they're thinking. And then from that point on, it's their responsibility to keep me posted on what's going on. And if they, and then I'll make suggestions. And if then they need, if they need me to contact someone because of the recruiting rules, where uh, you know coaches can't call until a certain point, um, then I'll do that too. But I don't. I don't think it's our responsibility to get a kid into a school. It's the family, but in particular the individual, the young lady or young man. It's your. It's their responsibility to do the homework, do the research, um, keep in proper touch. But we do need to guide high school coaches that are involved in the process. Is fine if they understand the collegiate realm. The high school coach sometimes is uh, also going to be involved as as someone that is guiding. We do have we do have uh, because I've witnessed it. Um, we do have um, some coaches uh, who will steer kids in certain directions because it might be more favorable to either themselves or the club, the i.e. the higher ilk type mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that happens less now than I can recall it happening in the past. Uh, so I do, I, I think the whole thing is advancing, you know, in a proper way. I think we have directors at clubs that really monitor their coaches. Um, and if they don't, then they really need to, they need to evaluate their coaches, not only how they're um, managing their teams and coaching their teams, what the training uh, items are, but also uh, in terms of the college process. Um, and I, I think uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot involved with it, but ultimately the, the kid has to take responsibility and then next the family and then the coach is there as a guide, but the coach should never tell a player where to go. I don't think. Well, again, when you look back now, 25 plus years of doing this and you look at the evolution of club soccer, there is a misconception, especially I think by parents 
that the coaches of club programs are going to do the heavy lifting for the kid. And a lot of the times, again, as you just mentioned, and it's a great point, that has to fall on the, the student athlete first. I mean, the parents shouldn't act as an agent for the player, number one. But number two, when you look at it too, we're something, if we go back 25 years, we didn't have a generation of parents who have played the game, Glenn. Now we do, as you start to recruit, and I'm older now, you have a generation of parents who have played the game and maybe have unrealistic goals of what levels their kids can play at. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I think there's 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 good and uh, and bad to that, and that the bad or the uh, the one where we need to provide constructive criticism is uh, is the thing that you just mentioned. But the good side of it is is that they they understand competition, they understand hopefully what a coach is going through. I uh, I host this program called the Coaching Academy on Sirius XMFC. Give it a plug here. Wednesdays at one o'clock Eastern, and uh, I recently had on Sky Eddie Bruce, sure. uh, who's a former All-American player and uh, coaches um, uh, with McLean now, uh, an ECNL club. And but she uh, she's the founder of SoccerParenting.com, and one of the things we addressed is how coaches uh, need to collaborate and include the parents on the collegiate level. It's a little trickier, but. And, and I, I, I fell into this trap um, early in my collegiate career where uh, most coaches will say, I, I don't want anything to do with the parents. I don't want anything to do with the parents. But there's, there are certain strategies where you can, I don't want to say get them on your side. Because, look, if their kid is not playing, you know, we've, all, we've all encountered this. You know? And the parents who are listening here, you know, it's, if you can, I, I know because I coached, I coached at a high level before I had children. Then I coached at a high level with children, and I could tell and then watch them play and watch them subbed out of a game and never come back in. I've watched them only play 10 minutes in a game, and it's very it's, it's emotional. Mm -hmm. And I had to fight back sometimes, like, and then I had to just say to myself, look, you, you, you're a coach. You've been through this. There are decisions to be made, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to object to it. You're just going to trust the coach. Um, that's the hardest thing for a parent is this playing time conundrum where if their kid's not playing and then their kid gets on the phone and says, I don't know why I'm not playing, hopefully that's not true because coaches should certainly communicate uh, frequently um, what a kid can do to get back into it or is the player ahead of them just better right now and that's, that's just the way it is. And especially on a collegiate level where you get to a point where you know, people get fired when they don't win games right. on all levels. People get fired if they don't win games. So you, part of, part of you, you're developing young people, um, you're managing a program, you're teaching leadership, um, but you better win. Uh, and that's becoming more and more part of the deal. So I'm not going to play you because you work hard in training every day. I'm going to play you when you've earned the time. And by the way, if you get 10 minutes, then take advantage of those 10 minutes. Right. And in fact, if those 10 minutes are at the end of the first half, play so well so that I start you in the second half and I might not ever take you off the field for the remainder of that game. And you know what? If you have another good week of training, you might move into the starting 11. How about that? So um, I would like parents to understand that more goes into the decisions than they see and or by talking to their daughter or son only. You, 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 you rarely get the full picture when that happens. I have children. I know. So um, I don't even know if I answered the question, guys. But. <laughs> no, you, you absolutely did. And just to go back to, to Sky Eddie Bruce, I worked a bunch of years for, with her at camps for uh, Tony DeChico and is just a quality person, quality person. Yeah, and she's the same way. She started out without kids. Now she has two daughters, and she sees it from a different realm. And her, her theme is parents are not the enemy. Let's figure this out. And, uh, and I, I agree 100%. It's, a, it's easier to manage on the club level, though. So for the club uh, parents and coaches that are listening, a collaboration is necessary. I, I, I'll tell you a story. on the, uh, And I haven't done it again because it's rare when you're in these positions. But you, I, I was on the road with my club team last year, and we got a room, and I have these white sheets that I put up you know, for tactics and you know, set pieces and all these things. They stick to the wall. Brilliant. Quick goal has them. They're, they're really, mm -hmm. If you go on the road, they are perfect. Yep. Uh, 
so, but we were eating meals in the same room too, including the parents. So I had had a meeting and then uh, we dismissed the meeting. Uh, the kids were there and then the parents came in to eat. And one, uh, two of the moms were up and they were standing next to one of these white sheets, which was still on there. They were showing something. And uh, so they called me over and they started asking me, can you, can you just explain what this is? So I, yeah, I, I talked to them about it. And then I, I said to one of them, I, I said, do you think the parents would, would be into me just maybe doing just like a 20-minute chalk talk and you know, I can go through some of the things we do and why we do them? And they were like, yeah, that would be so cool. So I did it, and I can't, the reaction of the parents was phenomenal. I mean, thanking me not just then, but then the next day, you know, and we, you know, the morning of the game or whatever. It was just like, that was so cool. You know, I really appreciate it. But what it did is it just it included them a little bit more. And now when you make a decision, uh, when you say to them in that meeting, look, it's really important that you don't coach your daughter because this is what I'm doing, and you don't know that. Now you know a little bit more. I still don't want you to coach from the sideline, though. <laughs> so um, I think empowering the parents um, is important. And, it's again, it's easier to foster on the, uh, on the club level and probably – High school level. Boy, I hear high school nightmares with parents. What yep. is going on on a high school level? Yeah. Parents yeah. need to get it together. I mean, my daughter went through a local high school, and there were some bad things that happened on the parent side. One in particular, which was absolutely egregious, nearly criminal, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, what? I, I didn't realize. I think high school could be the worst. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Last piece of this question, Glenn. When you do speak of playing time issues, maybe why am I not playing? Often, as you know, whether it's U14 or college, you're going to get an email or a phone call from a parent. Isn't it better for the development of the student athlete for the kid to take responsibility, come to your office, send you an email, talk to you after training and say, coach, what can I do better? Why am I not in the front 11? Well, I only get one email uh, from a parent when that happens. It's the first one and then it's the last one. And you explained very courteously is that I, I'm not discussing playing time with you. But I think it's also important for the coach to say the following to a parent. It's like, I care about your daughter. But the, the, the soccer uh, is sacred. The soccer is sacred between your daughter, myself, my assistant, and this team. It is sacred. Now, beyond that, if your daughter is having, you know, issues, um, if not playing is, is like – is 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 affecting her mentally and I'm not aware of it. I want to know that. But if we have that meeting, you can't start asking me, well, why? no, no. So a parent needs to know and a coach needs to declare to that parent that I care very much about your daughter. Uh, if they're, you know, academic issues, any, you know, pro you know, anything that you think outside of the realm of the actual soccer that you want to talk about that you're concerned with, please, because, I might not see it, but parents can't get involved in the why. I, and at what age? You know, I don't know what that age is. You mentioned fourteen, I, I suppose, but certainly fifteen and beyond. Certainly, the time where you're a freshman in co uh, high school and beyond, the parent should not be involved in playing time issues with the coach. And let me just tell you this: I've had a father come up to be face to face and threaten me with a 20 year old, 21 year old about playing time. Um, so, you know, it happens and, uh, and, and I'm not a big guy and he was, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, uh, it was a little alarming. I've had a guy, this was an ODP leap over a glass table at a hotel to get into my face and ask me to go outside and, and, uh, and, 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 and fight. Uh, the interesting part about that is he was an ODB coach in the same program a year up from me, and I was coaching his daughter. So there are a lot of people who are nuts and crazy. But like I said earlier, I've become more sensitive to it ever since I had children. Because if you don't have kids and, and it doesn't happen to you, then you really don't know what the parents are going through. Totally. Mark? Uh, Glenn, we started off the podcast going over – uh, many of your successes. Can you now perhaps tell the audience what some of the toughest challenges have been in your career? Yeah, I think uh, I, for me, it was being completely organized, 
disciplined to the detail and and not and this might sound odd not afraid of confrontation because as a coach you know let's just say you sense that a player on the collegiate level is going out at night and, and breaking team rules right you, you just sense it sense something's going on but instead of and what it does is adds to the agony of your life. It's going to add extra time taking away from you watching film to develop your, your team. Sometimes I got caught up in like, I'm a coach and, uh, you know, I did, I'm a coach. I've got to study the opponent. I've got to study our team. I got to look at each individual. I got to meet individually with players to, to correct their mistakes. I don't have time for, uh, Hey, stop drinking at night or, uh, or, uh, your, your, you know, your attitude is, you know, needs to improve. And then we have to have these meetings, and so I and I learned the hard way because I let one team uh, probably get a little out of hand, and uh, because I was avoiding it, and uh, I'll admit that. But I avoiding it, I don't know. If that's the word. It was just more like, gosh, I just. But those things won't go away, and I bet you every coach can sense when it's not quite right. You come to training one day, and all of a sudden the environment's a little different. Something happened. Something happened. You know, whether whatever it is. So um, that's the thing I learned. Um, I learned that if somebody's a bad egg, um, you might give them one chance, but don't give them three or four. Uh, I'm talking about maybe a player that, when recruits are on campus, talks badly about the program. Severe stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, do not, in your recruiting, uh, once you get the players in your program, don't. Don't allow one person to uh, to ruin the chemistry, um, and I, I learned that along the way too. And I've had to eliminate players from the program. It's that that's the hardest thing ever because those players, and there haven't been many, but the ones I have, I had great relationship. You know, I, I you know in the recruiting relationship, you get to know the family. Um, you know, so I get to know the families very well. But if it's not right for the team, and that's your decision, and it's your job, and it's your job on the line. And you got to make the decision. So th those are some of the, I think, the, the, you know, the overall management of the team and understanding that every little detail is important and should not go, uh, don't ever let it fester, whatever it is. Got it. Chris? Glenn, you're doing so many things in the game of soccer and obviously now on the broadcasting end with Sirius. And you can also be found as New York City Football Club's radio uh, network co color commentator for the team. What's it like being around a professional team, that professional team, traveling, going to training sessions. They have a legendary coach in Patrick Vieira. What's it like being around that environment? Well, it's, um, you know, I also live in New Jersey, so, and I've gotten to know the, uh, the Red Bulls gang very well, too, which made this past weekend interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, Jesse Marsh, uh, we know each other quite well now. Uh, a guy named Jason Baum, who was uh, communications director at Rutgers while I was there, is now the head of communications at uh, or media relations. I'm not sure what his title is uh, for New York Red Bulls, yeah. and that that was two years ago. So right when I retired, he pretty much shortly thereafter got the job. So he's really helped me integrate into the Red Bulls. So I get to watch, and I try to go to training once a week for Red Bulls and once a week for New York City FC. Like I'll go to Red Bulls on Tuesday mm -hmm. and New York City on uh, Thursday, and I love because I'm still all about the education. I still coach. Right. And and it also helps me prepare for these broadcasts, uh, and and they're they're two different coaches, but um, their approaches uh, have proven to be successful. Except, um, got to talk to Patrick on Thursday about what happened <laughs> this past <laughs> weekend. But I, I've become very close to Patrick. We do a, I do a, <clears throat> I spend a, a, about twenty minutes with him before each game. Part of that is recording a pregame show for the radio broadcast. I see him at training. I see him at the road on the road, and I, it was just <clears throat> by chance. But I flew home with him uh, from uh, Toronto. He took he had the seat right next to me, and it was very cool because he opened up his computer and he was watching the Red Bulls. So we watched the Red Bulls together, and he's 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 telling me things. He's sharing things tactically with me because I th he's come to know that you know I coach and uh, and I and I have I have an idea about what's going on and. Uh, uh, he is a legend. I mean, to just and but he doesn't carry himself like that at all. And he wants to learn. He understands he's a young coach, right? So he 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 accepts, you know, uh, suggestions. His coaching staff is very involved in what's going on. So uh, 
he makes that very clear that he's you know he's learning on the job. Um, tactically, they they go at things a little differently. He and Jesse uh, Patrick has the European approach. The mannequins, forty five minutes of tactics every day. You know, running patterns, running patterns. He wants to build out of the back, play through the midfield, and it's that kind of a control of the game uh, tactic and and scheme that he wants. Jesse Marsh, real uh, in uh, on, on the contrary, is is pressing and counter pressing, which means. Once you have a team in their end, don't ever let them out. And they're very risky with how they push their fullbacks up into that end and put them right on the tail of the wingers for that team, whether they're midfielders or, or forwards, so that there's no way out. Mm-hmm. And certainly you saw a lot of that um, in that 7-0 route uh, on Sunday at the stadium. Quick question as I switch up just a little bit, Glenn. Uh, we got to see a Jack Harrison make his debut on, on Saturday. He came from a Man U uh, academy program, but also played NCAA soccer. Do you think the NCAA rules prohibit college soccer from being a, uh, a viable development option for a professional player or someone with professional soccer aspirations? Well, Ray, Re- Ray Reed at UConn would say so because uh, he's one of the guys, um, I'm pretty sure I have this right, he's one of the, uh, on the men's side of the collegiate game that is pushing for the uh, full academic year calendar, whereby you would stretch out the soccer season to uh, the, the fall and the spring uh, would be bridged. And, ul- and ultimately what you've got is you're playing one match a week instead of two on a Friday, Sunday, or Thursday, Saturday, or whatever, uh, co- or, or Wednesday, Saturday. doesn't matter. Playing more than one competitive match at that level. And you see in MLS they're forced to do it, and you see the effects on these teams. And New York City made seven changes Vieira made seven changes for that match against Toronto. It was a midweek match sandwich in between Portland and New York Red Bulls. Well, you know what? On the college level, you don't have that kind of depth. Mm-hmm. You just don't. And so you're forcing these kids to, uh, to really – you can't train. You can't tra- training in the fall in college soccer is limited. Most of what you get out of uh, training is set pieces – uh, you can work a little tactically on your opponent, you know, how you might play against them. You probably can only compete, like really go at it one day a week, depending on, on the schedule, you know, of your games that week. And, and the rest is you really have to learn about yourself and the opponent w- by the use of film. So a- absolutely the current situation in college inhibits development because, and I think this is the two reasons, because you cannot train your team in the fall or individuals because you have to rest them constantly and then well the other part of it is that is that rest and recovery everybody uh, is buying into periodization and this is a you know you take your whole soccer year and then you you chart out every day as to low medium high intensity and what you're going to do in those days and you do that for the protection of the athlete you, you imagine you get a soft tissue injury third game of the season you're out two to three weeks how many you miss six matches so it, it it's crazy so you're injured you miss matches uh you can't develop because there's not enough training time but it's also the collegiate level mm-hmm. will it ever change i hope so uh and and not everybody's on board with it not everybody agrees with me or ray reed uh or um, rob kehoe who's the uh, program director uh and liaison for the nscaa and the ncaa who's really pushed for it, uh, and MLS is pushing for it. Yep. And my, uh, former, my former coach, Sasha Shirovsky. Yep. Oh, oh, he's, oh he's the, he might be the biggest proponent, yep. and, he's the, and he's also the most prominent voice. I mean, Sasha, when he speaks, people listen. Uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, it curtails development, no question about it. But, you, but the people who um, look at it the other way say, well, is college – I mean, are we responsible for developing professional athletes in college? And I have to tell you, there's a point to that. There's definitely a point to that. Mark. Glenn, um, could you perhaps go over a point or two as far as what the biggest obstacles facing student athletes in high school, uh, particularly those that want to continue their athletic career in college? And you're talking soccer, right? Uh, Yes, please. Well, the biggest – I don't know if these are hurdles. I just think they – the families and the students have to be, if they want to play on the collegiate level, 
Uh, they need to start the process of identifying things early. That doesn't mean things can't change. So in other words, do you want to, do you want to start thinking about it your freshman year? That's up to you. You might, have a, you might say, I want to go to school on the West Coast. I always have. I wanted to go to school in the Southeast, and I did. I went to the University of Georgia. I, uh, I went there on an, uh, you know, for a visit in, in the middle of February. It was 80 degrees, and there were 15,000 women on campus. So I was like, listen, I told my mom, the journalism program here is great. This is where I want to come. And I, you know, you might have that. You might have a geographical preference. Uh, you might, it, everybody's different as to when they know what they want to do. I always knew what I wanted to do. Uh, so you target schools that way. You may want to stay close to home. Um, you may want to play multiple sports. On the Division One level, that's becoming more and more difficult. You need to be exceptional at both sports. You need to be exceptional or it's not going to happen for the most part on the Division One level. So now you should turn, turn to Division Three, where it's encouraged to play two sports. Right. Uh, and... So there's, there's just decisions to be made along the way. So I think the biggest challenge might be don't wait till your junior year and then try to dive into it or your senior year, which some people do. You know, start the process early, but don't be pressured. It's not pressure. It's just like, you know, you get your syllabus and you have a term paper due three months from when you get your syllabus. So are you writing it at two months and 29 days or are you starting to write it, you know, on the fifth day and then a little more on the 10th? You know what I mean? So um, I think the same thing works if you have this strong desire to uh, to play at the collegiate level. Right, and we've said we've had um, other uh, guests on that. You know, the underlying tone is you want to pick a school that you can see yourself being there for four years uh, in case something happens to you on uh, the soccer field and you can't play. I'm going to take the counter argument there. I love soccer. I'm passionate about soccer. I, I go and visit a school. You know what? I'm basing a good part of my decision about this soccer program because that's going to be a major part of my experience. I don't agree with that philosophy is what I'm going to say. I think you can make at any school. Do you think there's not a school in America that, has, that doesn't have outstanding professors, that does not have clubs? And this stuff is, you should be identifying anyway. The, the kind of clubs that you might uh, want to be involved with an environment of the kind of people that are at that campus. That's what's most important, the people, right? So, yeah, you should if you just like the soccer and you don't get a good feel for the rest of the of the school at all from an environmental standpoint, sure. But I don't like saying don't you know, in case you have a you know, career ending injury or in case the staff leaves. You know, those things don't happen that often in in a kid's career. They don't. They, it's happened to some people, there's no question. But it's not like in this high, high percentile that it happens. So why, when you're making your choice, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you put that right, you know, the academics and the soccer, put it right next to each other? Why not? Why not? But again, if, if, if you only like the soccer and the rest of the school you hate, it's different. But you can, make, you can make anything happen for you. You really can. Have you guys ever been like in, a, in, in any kind of job environment where really – you know, it, it, you weren't you weren't particularly happy about it, but you 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 figured it out, and then you found a friend, and then you you you, did, you know there was a way to maneuver it so that it was like it was a satisfying experience. You get the same thing on a college campus. So you know, I know people disagree with me, and uh, and I would say in the recruiting process, when kids came to Rutgers, I said, look, you may not choose Rutgers, uh, you may want to go here, 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 but but uh, because they'll say that, go well, you know, we want to make sure that um, you know. In case something happens, we're still happy at the school. And, I, and I, that's when I would get into this. I go, look, if you love a staff and a program and, and, and this is your passion, you have a strong academic program that favors you as well, why would you do that? So that's my only counter to that. Point taken. Uh, so question is pros and cons of playing in uh, Division One, Two, and Three on the soccer side. Uh, the pros of Division One and Two uh, from a family standpoint – uh, where cost can be a factor is that there are scholarships available, but in men's and women's soccer, everyone needs to understand that if you get a scholarship, the high, high, high likelihood is that it's going to be partial. So it behooves you to um, do the best you can academically. Some of the best packages I've given 
families over the years have been a combined athletic academic scholarship, which you can do on the Division One and Two level. <clears throat> it's not available on the Division Three level. So that's first, and that's a financial picture. Uh, Division Three, I think I mentioned earlier, you can play multiple sports, or you can just play your sport. And I think um, you know, I, I know that Division Three programs will do things in the off season, but there's a mandated limitation as to what they can do. I think they're only allowed ten practice sessions, and only one competition in the spring, the Division Three level. So it, it's less of a commitment. There's no question about it, and it's less travel. So Division Three might allow you to do more within the framework of the school than you could at a, a Rutgers University, for instance, where you're spending so much of your time on your sport that, and the academics is very challenging that you really don't necessarily have a lot of time for other things, although we've had some amazing kids over the years who have put in a lot of volunteer time. I mean, nobody works. Nobody has a job. It's really, you just can't. But the amount of uh, um, things that these special players, not just our players, but players across the country, these special players will do in terms of community service within a packed schedule uh, has always amazed me. And that's one of the, you know, when, when I have athletes that do that, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of them. So, uh, and then Division II, uh, you know, I'm not as experienced in that. Uh, there's very few Division II school cool, schools, uh, Division II schools in the country. Uh, that doesn't make it bad. And in some cases, it might give you a better opportunity to uh, get into the NCAA tournament and um, but I think the biggest thing between all three, I, I don't look so much at the differences with all three as to what is the best spot you know, for the student, for the high school student, based on the overall. What experience are, do you want from college? That's what a kid has to, has to really find out. And we had, we had players come to Rutgers, great kids, and one or two years in, they decided they weren't they weren't getting enough of a college experience that they really wanted and they weren't as passionate about soccer either as they once were or as they thought they might be. So they ended up changing course and it was the right decision because they were going to be miserable uh, with something that they weren't as passionate about and they would also feel like they're missing out <clears throat> on some of the other things going on on campus. So uh, because colleges offer so much. You know, I, I look and observe different things going on at Rutgers. My wife is a professor there. Uh, my son just graduated, and my daughter's going to Rutgers next fall. And I'm excited for her, as I was for him, because all the different things going on on campus, the different speakers, all uh, the, I mean, there's a, such a massive scale of things and opportunities there for, for kids. So I can understand someone who doesn't want to just dedicate, you know, half of their time to a sport, half to academics, and not really have time for anything else. Yeah, your time management uh, skills have to really be on point. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Glenn, before you mentioned about now freshmen with verbal commitments and sophomore with verbal commitments in the recruiting process starting so much sooner than it did, let's say, even 15 years ago, what's the best way, do you think, uh, for student athletes to contact coaches, number one, and when do you really believe that process should begin? I got hired at Rutgers in the year 2000. Late, so my first recruiting class was really 2001. My, my first recruiting class included Carly Lloyd. Everybody in that recruiting class, I think we had 10 really good players. Everyone in that recruiting class uh, decided after their official visit in either September of Octo or October of their senior year, just to give it some perspective as to where it, where <laughs> it is now. So Carly Lloyd, right? Carly right. Lloyd today right. committing as a freshman. Okay, right. She'd be committing somewhere as a freshman because she would have every top ten program in the country in in the way that's legal, letting her know that this is the place for her. And uh, I think that's uh, that's stark in terms of, and that's only what was that? That's that's sixteen years ago. So you're right on. You're right on, uh, Chris. That it's you know it's like fifteen years ago, sixteen years ago. Yeah. So I think for the players, in terms of their contact. We talked about they should start their research early. The high-level player, you know, and that's where you have to you have to evaluate yourself. And this is where you get your coaches uh, involved a little bit. Is it's okay to start identifying schools and making some sort of contact with colleges as a freshman? I I can't deny that that's the path to take. You, you know, now it, again, and 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 I said earlier that families are in control. I really believe that. Some families are in more control than others. Some families 
who can pay the full cost of a college education versus families that cannot. And that's where the nervousness comes in a lot of times with scholarship programs and athletes who are trying to figure this out. So you start your communication process early. You, you know, develop some sort of a list. And basically, it can just be an introductory letter. The one thing I would say and, and, and advise, and I think all my colleagues on the college level would agree, when you're writing to a college coach, two things. Number one, make sure it's not a form letter that you've sent to 250 other coaches. In fact, I have to tell you guys, I've received things from, from players that in the, you know, in the two, in the copy area on the top of the email, were like 200 other coaches saying things like, dear coach, um, I really, you know, I really like your program and the things you're all about. And there's 200 people that it was written to. So I think people, you know, you have to be careful with that. You have to make it personal. But you cannot write anything long. Do not, I repeat, do not write an email telling your life story. Write an email suggesting that, uh, learn something about the program. Like they won the national championship last year. Uh, dear Coach Walsh, uh, 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 congratulations uh, on winning the national championship. I really enjoy the way your team plays, uh, and I've heard it's a great environment, and that's why I'm contacting you now. And then you, and then maybe you give a schedule of where you're playing and who your club and club coach is, uh, but do not tell your life story. If there's a if there's a very rem if there's a really strong academic thing that you want to mention, great. If you already have an academic interest and you know that that school has it, put that in there. If a family member has attended that university, make sure it's in there. But beyond that, don't tell your life story. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten like that. And it's, we don't, look, it's not that we're not interested, but if you're getting 50 to 100 emails a week and you're trying to sort things out uh, as a program and decide on your recruiting calendar and who you're going to see and all these and make these calls to coaches you know, the club or high school coaches, you know, to get an idea of the level of the player or whoever you need to do that, you, you can't make these things long. But that was, this is a long-winded answer to your question, you know, about contacting. The rules state that you can't, a uh, college coach can't start calling you um, and writing you until your junior year. I don't remember the particular date now because it's actually changed since I retired from Rutgers. But during your freshman and sophomore year, you gotta, you've, you've got to do it with, with your club and high school coach who can act as the conduit. For instance, if a club coach sees you and, and wants to start the recruiting process, oftentimes they'll call the, call the club coach and just say, look, please let so-and-so know that uh, I really like the way he or she played and uh, <clears throat> that we're going to start the recruiting process. And that, that's a good thing. And then sometimes a call will be arranged and, and you go from there. So I don't think a freshman is too early to start. I think sophomore is fine. And, and one thing, guys, I should point out is that, you know, I coached on the women's side. The men's side is different. I would say Ray Reed would probably chuckle uh, if I said, uh, um, you know, start contacting coaches as freshmen because it probably doesn't happen that much on the men's level, on the men's side. But certainly the sophomore year for everybody, you know, is, 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 a, is a good time. I'd say for the women, you know, again, uh, the freshman year is not too early. But, again, don't go crazy. Uh, but sophomore year, certainly, you got to really start getting getting a move on. You've answered the easy questions so far, Glenn. Now we're going to put you on the hot seat. We got a couple quick questions that Mark uh, and I have developed for the getting to know you portion. Oh, this geez. is these are the hard hitting questions right now, Glenn. This is the Barbara Walters portion of the interview. <laughs> All right, let, <laughs> let me definitely clear my throat for this go, one because it sounds like I'm going to gag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number one. If we were to search your phone, what would be the top three played songs or artists? Oh. NRBQ, the New Rhythm and Blues Quartet. Wow. The greatest club band in the history of rock and roll. What I mean by that is very few people know about them, but if you saw them play in a club, and they're still going at it. And um, I, unfortunately, I have a New York City FC game. They're going to be in New York, and I can't go. This summer, I'm so upset. If you're I'm from so Connecticut, upset. if you're from Connecticut, like Mark and I, uh, oh, you know, you know, you know RBQ real well, sure. Uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, the boss, and I, I can't believe I was at a ODP tryouts 
and the kids were all lined up, and I like I like goofing around and having a good time. I, and I, so I said, uh, you know, I, I really got psyched for training today or, or tryouts today. What listen to Springsteen? Uh, who knows who Bruce Springsteen is? There's a lineup. I'm telling you right now. There's a lineup of 80 kids. Two kids raised their hand. What's wrong with our youth? Seriously, <laughs> what is wrong with our youth? It's not computer I, generated. That's why. <laughs> and number three. You know, that's hard because I, I tell you, I, uh, I listen to AM radio, I listen to FM, and I have Sirius XMFC. One of the reasons I like Sirius is I can, I can move about uh, with things that, uh, depending on what my mood is, like Coffee House, I love that because it's nice and, nice and soft. So I'm just going to go with NRBQ and, uh, and The Boss, and then there's a lot of other things after. Fair enough. Uh, next, <clears throat> what books or book are you currently reading? And if none, what books would you suggest to our listeners? I'm reading perhaps the greatest soccer book I've ever read right now. It's called Pep Confidential. There was a writer, Marty Perinow, who had unlimited access, was welcomed in by Pep Guardiola his first year at Bayern Munich. And it's, uh, I've told, I, I, what I do on my, on my show, The Coaching Academy on Sirius, I, every week I do a Pepism. And what it is, is it's either a quote or a theory or something from Pep that I'm taking from this book. So I've got my yellow marker out. I haven't even gotten through the book yet because I, I keep stopping to, to, to mark it up because every page has something for me that's enthralling from a coaching standpoint and being on the inside. Uh, coaches listening to this, Pep Confidential, buy it or borrow it or something. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, do you have a favorite quote? I do. Let me make sure I make it, get it right. John Wooden, All right? And everyone goes, oh, yeah, he's got a lot of quotes. Well, this is one that um, I, I think is important. I think for, for, for anybody uh, who uh, thinks they're an authority and, and maybe doesn't listen well um, to other people, like I said, one of the things I love about Patrick Vieira is that he's listening and he's learning. So he would love this quote. John Wooden had a quote, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. And I've used that quote with players and colleagues uh, very often in my life. That's a good one. And with myself, by the way. <laughs> Every now and then I get a little, you know, haughty with that and go like, uh, no, well, remember the quote. Remember the quote. <laughs> uh, next, can you give the listeners a little known fact about yourself? Well, I was a pretty good uh, trumpet player. <laughs> I, uh, wow. my, fa my father was a band director at Morristown High School in New Jersey for 35 years and I played the trumpet uh, from an early time in my life and uh, played through high school. When I got to college, I brought the trumpet with me and I, but I didn't, I didn't get involved in any like band organization, but I, I would jam every now and then with people or bring it out at Christmas. And uh, in fact, my mother-in-law, you know, really, she's really disappointed when I don't bring my trumpet to, uh, to our Christmas gatherings because it's all, there's so much music that's played at the holidays, not just Christmas, but anytime we get together for the holidays. Um, so I don't play much anymore, hardly at all. When I got out of college and came home, I played in a big band. Every Wednesday night we uh, practiced. And uh, and actually we played uh, we played New Year's Eve at Rutgers one time. That was well before I uh, really was involved with Rutgers. So, uh, oh, wow. yes, I am. I was a pretty good trumpet player. That's awesome. And lastly, uh, any web-based sites or tools that you just simply – can't live without either work related or on a personal level can't live without i hate to admit that because <laughs> That's that, why these are the hard-hitting questions yeah i'm i will be honest some of the happiest days of my life is when i've either lost my cell phone or <laughs> have a self-imposed mandate to you know hide it when i'm away with my family or or whatever it is um, those are relaxing moments. They were especially relaxing in college because that thing never shut up. Um, but I will, if I have to pick one, I will say Twitter. And um, my wife, Dr. Mary Chaco, got to give her a plug because she's the one. She's a social media expert. In fact, she uses Twitter in her classes at Rutgers, which uh, some people would be appalled by, I'm sure, on the professional level. But um, obviously, her stu she has the students are allowed to have their computers up and. You know, during her classes, and, and she uh, she's really she's developed some things that are actually revolutionary and are used uh, across the country now. I um, she she was so 
insisted that I get on Twitter while I was at Rutgers. And I just, I don't have time for this. And I was afraid of it. You know, I just, I don't want people, I just, you know, I might press the wrong button and I don't know, I'll say something I don't really want to say. Um, but it has become a very, very important professional tool for me, and I'll use it for personal uh, stuff as well. And in fact, I learned, and everybody kids me that's around me. I have a, my play-by-play guy, Tom Kolker, is younger than me. He's like 20 years younger than me, and, and he just kids me all the time because I'm, I'm pretty bad. You know, you guys try getting me on Skype, you know, that was like a big accomplishment for me this morning. <laughs> so he, uh, he, just, they, he just laughs at me all the time. But I do a perisc- I do a live periscope. I want you guys to watch. Yep. I do a live periscope before we get it, like five minutes before we go on the air for our pregame before every New York City game. And I'm very proud of myself that I figured out how to do it and, and people uh, look at it. Yep. So there That's you go. Great. That's a great platform. Yeah, it's, really, it's really unbelievable. I should do it more, I, I, but I don't want to overdo it. You know? I, think, like, I think that's something you could do too much. You know, and yeah. then, you yeah, know. Chris, Chris and I were toying with the idea of doing uh, one of our podcasts uh, live. I, I think you should. You know, on, on that platform. So, we'll no, see. you should. I, I um, I'm trying to. I, I haven't really put my mind to it, but there's got to be other ways I could use it effectively. And uh, and and for me, guys, you know, I I changed the course of my life, and um, I'm really I'm trying to brand myself as the soccer guy. You know, come to me for the soccer info, and uh, you know, it's it's working pretty well, and. It's uh, I'm really embedded in the sport now, and actually getting away from the women's game a little bit has allowed me to really, uh, you know, watch the men's game a little bit more. Although I still am involved in the women's game, and you know, I still I have three players uh, that I coach that are on the full women's national team. So, you know, I'm 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 very involved. I write columns for Our Game magazine and ECNL, which are, are women's based platforms. But I've really expanded the horizons being able to watch uh, the game internationally, uh, the men's side collegiately. So I'm really, uh, I'm really in a good way personally because um, I, I'm, I'm allowed to do all this, which, uh, you know, you're a little limited when you're a college coach because of the time you have to spend, you know, managing your program. Sure. Well, you made it through the getting to know you section uh, famously. So I'm going to throw it back to Chris. <laughs> yeah, you can wipe the sweat off your bra right now, Glenn. It's all over with that part. We're into the home stretch of the last couple questions. Um, I love to ask me my favorite group, and I could say NRBQ, right? And, and we know, and we know who it is. Yeah. yeah, man, I, I was mean, just, I was just listening to them yesterday. I mean, that's how frequently I I, I try to put them. You know, there's this song called Mona. When I was at the University of Georgia, I had to drive 40 miles to a radio station in Elberton, Georgia, and uh, and I had the wind. It was a beautiful spring day. Boom, 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 and I was listening to this NRBQ song, and I was really into it. And I came to the sharp turn. Which I did. I kind of uh, negotiated poorly. I ended up in a ditch. <laughs> so NRBQ, NRBQ pushed me into a ditch because I was listening to this song. Yeah, that's Mark, how good they are. That's how good they are. Mark and I grew up uh, right outside of New Haven. So when NRBQ played at Toad's Place in New Haven, it was always an event. Always, uh, the place was crazy down there for those nights. How fun are those guys? I, it's just they're fun. That's what it should be, man. Oh, you know, oh. you're you being a Jersey guy like uh, brings back the uh, was Southside Johnny kind of thing was one of those fun bands too. No question, yeah, no question. But even he would play these major venues. I mean, what's the largest NRBQ would play? They played the Bottom Line in New York. I, I've I've never seen him in a larger one. And that, what does that hold? Like two hundred people? Not even that. <laughs> I mean, that's the best part because you're you're there. I used to go see them at a place called Stanhope House in New Jersey. What a, it's literally was a house converted into this. Uh, saw some great groups there, Steve Forbert, you know, people like that. And Steve Forbert, you're like so close to these guys, you know, and and they're there and they're just having fun. They love the club scene. So anyway, I spent too much time on NRBQ, but it's a rare time where I could talk about NRBQ. <laughs> last part for me, last questions for me, Glenn. What's the best piece of advice you have for parents, and what's the best piece of advice for uh, student athletes who are going through this process? Ah. Uh, yeah, I know the answer to this because this is what I advise parents and kids. Kids, children, students, you have to understand that this is a tough time for your parents. It's very emotional for them. The choice of your college is something where you need to respect the fact, to be sensitive to the fact that they brought you into this world and they've done everything with you up to this point. So for you to exclude them from the process, which sometimes kids, they just don't want to hear from their dad or they don't want to hear from their mom. 
is is rude, wrong, and you're not, and you should accept some of the things that they have to say. So listen to your parents. You will make the ultimate decision. They won't. But please be sensitive to the fact that they've gone through a lot with you, and you need to listen and be kind and respectful. Parents, on the flip side, you cannot freak out on your kid about the application process and get all crazy and try to take over the process, which many parents do. And so what I'm suggesting, and parents, you just heard what I said about what your children should do, so I'm not saying you're not involved, but don't be overzealous. Do not. So there's a balance here between parent and child that is paramount in this process to make it enjoyable and to help the kid pick the best school. So everybody, calm down, do your preparation, work as a team. I'm talking about the kid and the parents because I've seen so many situations where it, it's not the kind of team and teamwork that I think will be beneficial, um, and that's my advice. That's great, great advice, uh, and here, here to that. Mark? All right. Uh, in honor of time and your failing voice, <laughs> let's wrap this up. It's been a, an absolute pleasure for us uh, talking to you today, Glenn. I'll give you uh, a couple of moments. Uh, how can listeners get in touch with you? Well, my Twitter is at Glenn Crooks. That's pretty easy. As long as you spell my first name with two N's. And um, I write uh, two weekly soccer columns, one for CBS New York WFAN.com and one for uh, a website called Empire of Soccer, a really good site. Uh, I write them on a weekly basis. I host this Sirius XMFC program called the Coaching Academy uh, every Wednesday at 1. And then um, in terms of uh, if, if somebody listens and they really want to get in touch with me, uh, you guys are free to give them my uh, email address as well, and they can um, they can go for it. I'll make sure all of these get put up on our show notes. Uh, so when I put it up on iTunes, you'll be able to access that info uh, directly themselves. So Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I'm happy to help. I, yeah. Honestly, if there's a parent listening and you really have a question, uh, I've been a high school coach, club coach, ODP coach, college coach. I have children, and uh, I've been doing this for like 35 years. So um, I, 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 have, I think I have some sage advice, but – Pertaining to my quote, I'm still learning all the time as well. I really am. So I don't have all the answers. Uh, there's still more to learn. Uh, but uh, I'd be happy to help anybody if they, ever, uh, if they were ever inclined to. Well, that's a huge offer, and we appreciate that. Uh, last thing before we wrap up, do you have anything you wish to promote today? Promote? Let's see. Uh, well, I, promoted, I already promoted my weekly show, which I think, you know, and part of that, that show, it's about coaching and player development. I've had some unbelievable people on. For instance, on Wednesday, I'm going to have a guy named Todd Bean on. He's the son-in-law of Johan Cruyff. Oh, wow. He's in Barcelona. He, uh, he runs an academy called Tovo International. And his outlook on the game, let's just, let's just put it this way, he lives in Barcelona, so enough said. <laughs> but he's got a lot of great information about uh, the development of the game. And, 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 and I think it's an important show because it gives a lot of people a voice uh, in what they feel are the, some of the best ways to uh, not only develop individuals, but to develop teams at certain age groups. So we've had professional coaches on, we've had youth coaches on, we've had directors on, we've had players on. And I think uh, if I could plug one thing, it would be that Sirius XMFC show on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. By the way, a lot of people ask me, I get a lot of at requests, well, is it on a podcast? No, you have to be a Sirius XM subscriber. And if you can't listen to the show Wednesday at 1, I know people are working, they might be in school, it replays three or four times during the week, but it's also available on the uh, SiriusXM app, which if you subscribe to SiriusXM, you've got to get the app, because right, then right. you can listen to it on your computer and your phone, and you can hear it at home. You don't have to just be in your car. So that will be the... Uh, and then, um, you know, listen to the NYCFC games on WFAN and... Sometimes those games are on Sirius XM and, you know, and read my columns and react to them if you like. <laughs> Wonderful. Appreciate it, Glenn. And once again, uh, right, thanks for your time. We appreciate you coming on the program. No problem. It was a pleasure, guys. And for the uh, TCS Nation listeners, uh, just remember you can contact us on the web at tcsnation.com. 
uh, make sure you sign up for the Friday Five, your first name and email. Uh, that's five items sent out weekly that we're either interested in or pondering. <laughs> email is chris at tcsnation.com or mark at tcsnation.com. Facebook.com slash tackling college sports. Twitter at TCS Nation and Instagram, TCS Nation. And until next time, be your best. Be your best. Your college sports future awaits. So join the TCS Nation and be your best.